I'm Ronnie Parker. I'm Julie Parker. Yeah, everything was, was kind of a storybook. In January of 2016 happened. I was scheduled to do what I normally do. My volunteer position at Wellspring, I was running pro presenter, which means I sit through three services. I hear Trey's messages three times. I've, I've got his notes in front of me. So um, it gives me kind of a lot of opportunity to absorb what's being said. He was starting a series, um, kind of a typical, what I thought was gonna be a typical New Year's type series about resolutions and, and that sort of thing. And, and it just didn't, it didn't turn out anything like that. This one was kind of flipped on its, on its head. The focus was not on self-improvement, but what you were gonna do to, to improve uh, people's lives around you. So the theme of that message was what breaks your heart when you answer that question then what are you going to do about it and so um i was sitting there you know the first service heard it obviously heard it two more times and i and i just couldn't shake the thought of um you know kids growing up and not having a mom or a dad and um, so I kind of wrestled with that over that three or four hours there at, at the service. We had both heard the sermon, but Ronnie said, I think we need to, um, I think we need to become foster parents. And so when Ronnie says that to me, I'm thinking, well, that's easy for you to say. In fact, I think I did say, it's, that's easy for you to say, because I'm the one that would stay home. And in a previous year, I had been um, dealing with the beginning stages of breast cancer. So also I was thinking, you know, I just need to take care of myself as much as I can and not be stressed. So I was not very open to the idea of becoming a foster mom at that point because I felt like I had enough on my plate. So and since 2015, the need for foster families has grown tremendously because of the drug problem. So I mean, I can't remember how many kids in Warren County alone, but it, they're, they desperately need foster families. I knew we were supposed to do it, but I just didn't know kind of how how we were going to do it. Yeah. That's, that would have been maybe February. We maybe made our first call, and then we had the license in was it August. So yeah. it took us that long, and so that was probably a good thing. It probably helped us process what we were, you know, getting ready to, you know, get ready to do and get involved with. So we were licensed for maybe a day, mm -hmm. and. We received a phone call from DSS about this little boy, and and I kept thinking, this is not our kid. This is not him. And I, I called Ronnie, and Ronnie agreed. He was like, yeah, I, I agree with you. He's not the one we're supposed to, to have. So I called DSS back, and I said, I'm sorry, but we're not going to be able to take him. And literally five minutes later, I got a call from another lady at DSS, and she called us about Luke, and she had she said several things that were a little intimidating or scary to hear, but I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say, this is your kid. And I called Ronnie and he was like, you're right, this is our, this is our kid. So we, we were given him pretty much right away. Yeah, it's surreal, you know, you, to, to meet a, a caseworker at a, at a Walmart parking lot, you know, and there's a van, you, know, you pull up, a van pulls up, and out pops this kid with this little garbage bag with all everything he's got. And you sign a couple papers and he's, he's, he he's, he's in your car. I know. So it, it, it was it was really it just that moment was, I mean, almost almost even more than the birth kids, even their even their birth. I mean it's it's something about that moment was just 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 really unbelievable. God kept showing me the verses over and over, be strong and courageous from Joshua. I kept seeing it everywhere. And I knew, I knew that God was telling me to get over my fear. And so as soon as we saw Luke get out of the van, it just melted away because we're like, look at this precious little child who is terrified because he has been through horrible experiences. And so then all we could think about was how do we make him feel loved and comfortable and safe? That thought of, okay, what breaks your heart? And out comes this kid out of this van. That's that's what was breaking my heart. And so God put that thought and that child and our passion all together and 
made it all happen. It was our biggest desire to make him our son. The boys had been separated by DSS for different reasons. To be honest, I felt like my plate is full. I've got a lot going on. We're just gonna focus on Luke. And one day when we were actually meeting with the adoption caseworker, even though I'd been around them, she showed us Brandon's picture. And I heard the Holy Spirit so clearly say, you need to go get him now. And so after the lady left our house, I told Ronnie what I heard the Holy Spirit say. And she said, I heard it too. Yeah. So that's how one became. Yes. Became two. Yes. <laughs> and so we immediately applied to become his foster parents so that we could adopt him. We knew that the three boys should be together. He came back from working out on Saturday morning and I said, Ronnie, we need to adopt all three of them. And he was like, you're crazy, you're crazy. And I was like, but I know that's what we're supposed to do. And just a little bit later, he came back, he was like, you're right. Yeah. And God was so good and how we have Luke and then Brandon and then Hayden. And that was, um, you know, one of these, again, kind of surreal moments in your life where you know, you're at the courthouse. Um, you know, we've got obviously all of us, uh, all nine of us are there. Um, lots of friends from Wellspring that kind of helped us with the, you know, through this journey. Um, and, uh, you know, you, just to stand there in front of the judge and, and to see that it's official, that it's done. Um, Pretty, pretty amazing experience. Yeah. It was a huge relief to be, to know that they were ours. <laughs> we had already had to pack the car and we went straight to Virginia for um, to celebrate Christmas with the awesome. family up in Virginia. So it was, it was a crazy day. I mean, Hayden had kicked off his shoes and his vest. I mean, he was just screaming and yeah, it was a mess. And I got the receipt for <laughs> nine people at Chick-fil-A. You're like. Wow, we won't be eating out much, so. <laughs> kept ordering, kept ordering, kept ordering. And then we're like, wow, we have a big family. And a lot of people were just kind of staring at us trying to figure out what was going on there. But yeah, that was that was our one of our first moments. It was, it was great. And we found out from our attorney that the courthouse workers said that our boy's case was the fastest they'd ever seen go through the court system, ever. And we knew that God was just being so good to us and ending all the process and just making us an official family quickly. I was probably burned out in a lot of areas of my life, you know, just from a, you know, with business and, and a lot of extra commitments that I had made. And, uh, and honestly, I kind of, I guess, said yes to God before I even knew how it was all gonna, gonna work out. And God, God's got a real interesting sense of humor. It's just almost simultaneous with the adoption, the finalization of the adoption. Um, you know, God just kind of led our business through some, opened some doors and just allowed me to take a, have a big step back from a, from a responsibility standpoint. And, you know, gave me the opportunity to spend more time with Julie and the kids and to be able to help her more. So I, I just think that was, for me, that was a really, that's just a big moment in my life and my journey just to see you know, if God's calling you to do something, you know, he's, gonna make a, he's gonna make a way. I had a day in January where I was um, kind of feeling sorry for myself, like this is so much, this is a lot of work, this is a lot to do, a lot to keep up with. I think God thinks I can do more than I can do. You know, it's not the best attitude. And it was a Sunday morning and the Lord showed me that verse, John 10, 10, the thief has come to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And I knew he was talking about the boys. Jesus didn't come just to save me and then for me to just have easy life. You know, he came so that we can be the hands and feet to others. And, and I, I think about where our boys would be if they weren't with us. <laughs> it's a scary thought. Yeah, it is. So I think that's been the biggest thing I've learned is that life is not about us and our comfort and what's easy but it's about what God has called us to do. And He's going to equip you to do it and give you the strength, but you have to choose the attitude to live for Him and do what He wants you to do and to do it joyfully. But everybody's called to something. 
and um, there's a phrase that during this during the whole thing that this whole process that I kept bouncing around and, and it's you can't change the world but you can change somebody's world my guess is is that as people start opening their hearts and they start having a heart of service be prepared because God's going to give you more and more